The LodgeCast Reboots. The LodgeCast Reboots. You're listening to The LodgeCast, the podcast about leadership, business, life, and growth with me, your host, George Andriopoulos. It's like food for your ears. Launch sequence. Launch sequence activated. Launch sequence activated. Five, four, three, two, one. Woo! Hey, hey, everybody! Welcome to the launch cast. Episode 210, a reboot episode. Still goosebumps right under this sweatshirt. I know you can't see him. Guys, I'm so glad to be back for another episode, another intro, another chance to chill with you guys today. But first, it's the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos, bringing you your favorite podcast on the planet. Leadership, business, life, growth on the reboots as the beat drops. Into the black hole. What is happening, my friends? Welcome to episode 210, a launch cast reboot episode. It is the legend of the wish man. This one is something that I've been trying to squeeze in. Uh, we usually do the reboots at the end of of every season, right? We do a few uh, uh, rep uh, episodes that are the launch cast reboots as we sort of prepare for the next season coming. That's what we did last season. We did 39 live episodes straight before we jumped into reboot episodes in preparation for season two. But, um, you know, I mentioned a few episodes ago that one of our guests from last season, Frank Shankowitz, who was the co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation, the guy that really changed a ton of lives, a ton, a ton of lives uh, passed away recently. And so uh, I did speak about him on one of our episodes, but I wanted to hold space for Frank and be able to, um, you know, talk about him in a way that was meaningful. And so when I was preparing for that episode where I spoke about him a little bit, I wanted to play some clips and stuff, but I listened back to the whole interview and I was like, man, this was so, so special. Um, and you really can't, get you know uh, the, the the true picture of who this man was unless you listen to this whole story and so i decided mid-season here episode 210 we're going to run a launch cast reboot episode uh because we owe it to the man himself frank shankowitz to do this and so that's what we're going to do right now we're going to launch we're going to run a launch cast reboot episode so episode 210 is going to be a, a, a reboot of the original episode that Frank Shankowitz was on with some new content here, of course. Um, you know, I've spoken about this man so many times. I spoke about him a few episodes ago and what he meant to me. Um, so, you know, check out some of the older episodes just to find out, uh, you know, a little bit more about what I said about Frank. But uh, for today, I want you guys to sit back and relax and check out this interview with Frank Shankowitz himself, the wish man. Um, and... I think what Frank would have wanted, honestly, besides listening to interviews like this with him, is for you to get to know him a little bit more through his life story. And so his book, The Wish Man, and the movie, which is on Netflix, still streaming, um, it's out there. So go on to Netflix and check out Wish Man on Netflix. Incredible movie. Uh, I loved, loved, loved watching it. Of course, one of the producers of the movie, Greg Greg Reed, Dr. Greg S. Reed, uh, is one of my buddies. You know, he was a friend of the show. He was interviewed on the show. So, yeah, um, check out that movie. Sit back and, and listen to this episode. But real quick, real quick, I just want to drop a piece of news here. We, we said that we were going to be uh, announcing this soon. And so for a second here, I want to announce the new podcast coming. So the launch cast still going strong. We're still kicking ass every single week and we plan to continue doing it <coughs> as a weekly show as we've always been. But I have partnered with my buddy, Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson's a colleague of mine. Dave Thompson was one of the speakers at the original TEDx Farmingdale. Um, great, great dude. Good friend of mine. Um, 
He is one of the uh, 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 podcasts, is one of the hosts of uh, Sounds Like Autism, which is an amazing podcast. Dave and Josh were our guests uh, way back uh, in one of our episodes in season one. Dave and I are starting a new podcast called Over My Dad Podcast. The Over My Dad Podcast is going to be so much fun. It's all the stuff that I can't do here, right? This is a, a, a little bit of a more serious tone. We talk about serious conversations here, leadership. This is where we sort of let loose both of us, do our thing, go crazy, talk about our lives as dads, uh, do some bits for you guys, um, talk about news going on. Uh, th there's a hell of a lot of stuff going on. So check out Over My Dad Podcast, at Over My Dad Podcast. You could follow us on any social media platform out there. <coughs> and when I say any, of course, I mean uh Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, because those are the three we have, at Over My Dad Podcast. And I think on Twitter it's at Over My Dad Bod CST. Um, check us out. We are dropping our first four episodes in trailer on April 7th, and it's going to be out on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, all, all the places. So we'll, we'll share this as, uh, you know, as the moment comes. Um, but yeah, check that out. It's going to be a great, great, great time. Uh, super fun podcast. Can't wait to share it with you guys. So no further ado, we're jumping in. Episode 210, The Legend of the Wishman. Frank Shankowitz, we miss you, buddy. My guest today is, is uh, I, I will say this is a dream guest for me. Um, first, I'll introduce him, then I'll go into the bio. Mr. Frank Shankowitz. Frank, thank you so much for being here today, my friend. Thank, thank you for the invite. I appreciate it. Oh, Man, I, I, I couldn't think of a, a better guest to have on here. Uh, you know, you know, I'm going to get a little personal with this. We we started this show in an effort to um, to reach our audience and to reach the people that that I associate with and, and teach them that leadership is so important. And it's such a responsibility uh, for people out there. And if you have these abilities to, to be a leader and to go out and affect change, then it's really a responsibility to go and stand up and do that. And you, uh, Frank, are, are such an inspiration to me personally because I have a, a personal story associated um, with what you've built in your life, and we'll get into that later on. Um, so, so it's it's extra important for me that you're here today and and just uh, showing people that when you stand up, you can absolutely change the world. So first, I want to I want to thank you for that, Frank. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. So. Here's the bio, guys. Frank Shankowitz is the award-winning speaker, author, mentor, creator, and co-founder of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. A former Arizona Highway Patrol officer turned wish man, Frank Shankowitz granted the wish of a seven-year-old boy with leukemia who wanted to be a highway patrol officer. The rest is history. Frank has spent most of his adult life seeking to fulfill the dreams of others, no matter how big or small. He has changed the lives of thousands of people through his generosity, grit, and belief in the human spirit. His work has been honored by prestigious universities, countless media outlets, big name corporation, and even the president of the United States. His life story was recently told in the movie Wish Man, now streaming on Netflix, and we'll get into that later. And of course, he authored the book of the same name which inspired the movie. Um, wow, I, I never thought I'd be doing this issue, uh, this, this intro, Frank. <laughs> Uh, it's 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 a it's a true honor, like I said, and uh, I want to jump into it by asking you the question that we always ask of our guests first. Frank, are you a leader? Well, I, I strive to be, um, and I've always, my whole life, even as a young child, it seems like I was the guy chosen to be the school guard on up to captain of the football team, so on and so on. Even in the Air Force, uh, honor guard. Uh, and in my years at uh, the Highway Patrol, the Department of Public Safety, as a leader in that, because training other other young troops on the other detectives. So always, always kind of in that role. Never strive for it, but just seemed to be. And I think it was because of the uh, character and integrity training I had as a very young boy that kind of led by that example. Sure. Yeah, I can totally understand that. What... Talk to me about that further. What if what is your definition of a leader? Oh wow! Um, <clears throat> obviously, someone that can project what the mission is. But I always like to say the leader should lead by example. Um, 
people are out there doing the job and just say, do, don't go, just do that job and get it done. But I appreciate you doing that job. And the biggest thing for me that I would go and do that job with them. For years, I worked with Motorola and I had a, a whole team, I was a foreman there, had a whole team of, of ladies that were doing a very intensive inspections on component missile parts. And you could see the stress on that. And a lot of times, not only congratulate them, but I'd go set on the line with them. Here, let me help you out. Let me see what's going on. And then I'd say, am I doing this right? Do we have a better way to do this? What suggestions you have? But then also, let's take a little break. Let's go have lunch. Let's go. It's on me today. Just appreciate everything that they're doing. Yeah, it's it's interesting how um, this mentality of bringing the team along with you to success has been uh, such a mantra in most of the leaders that we have interviewed. Um, you know, I think there are leaders out there that are, are focused on the individual and just bringing their leadership out. But for me, it's it's always um, such a more effective way and such a more influential form of leadership when you sort of bring everybody along for the ride with you and, and the team has the success rather than just the individual. Um, and you said the key word, team. It's yeah. a team effort. If it wasn't, no matter what leader are, if the team's not following you, they're, they're going to sink you. Sure. So swim with them. <laughs> sure. And and it's it's super interesting because uh, you and I were introduced uh, a few weeks back by our mutual friend, uh, Greg Reed. Um, and I checked out the movie, which which we'll talk about later, which was incredible, and saw your life story. And then uh, I started researching you for, for this interview, and I wanted to really find out what the differences were between the movie uh, and, and the true life story, because obviously there are always creative liberties that happen in movies. Um, and so I think the biggest um, standout to me was that with what you built um, with with this foundation and then pass it on to sort of grow itself, I really, I, I really never heard about you, the individual. It was always the the mission of the foundation itself. And to me, that stood out so much. It was so interesting to know that there was just this organization out there that was about changing the world in such a unique way and not about the individual running it, you know? Well, yeah, it was never about me. It's all, the mission has always been about the kids. Uh, I've never wanted the limelight. I'm, I'm just not the type of person. But, and I don't want to say unfortunately, I guess fortunately, people started focusing on me and um, but what that gave me at the time was uh, more identification to promote the mission and the Make a Wish Foundation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so I want to get into into the life story, Frank, because um, a lot of what we do here is about the journey to leadership. If we're going to show our audience uh, how to stand up and be leaders, I love telling these stories and, and having leaders like you tell the stories of where. Uh, where you came from and what you had to go through to get to the point that you're at today. So um, I've done my research, so let's let's jump along this timeline here. So you were born in Chicago, right? Um, Correct. Mom and dad divorced when you were two, and from two to five you lived uh, with your grandparents while your dad worked, and you saw your dad on the weekends, right? Oh, yeah, very, very happy life uh, that I recall during that period. The family fun, my dad's side of family, always the joking, the picnics, the big Sunday dinners. Uh, great cousins. I mean, just a great, great young childhood. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I see that you have described it as as such a such a happy childhood during that time. And I do see from the movie itself. I haven't had the opportunity to read the book. It's on my list for next month. Um, but uh, I really see uh, the, the the light in which your your father was painted in the movie, and it was uh, uh, very endearing to me. Uh, something you know when I when I look at my dad, I, I have those same feelings that I saw in that movie, uh, and, and so um, you had a lot of s uh, positive feelings towards your father, right? From oh, what yes, I saw, definitely, yeah, definitely. And years later, we remained very, very close, but there was that journey in between those years that were uh, somewhat strange. In fact, that's why Hollywood decided to make a movie about it. So, but it wasn't an, any unusual for other kids during that period. And at five years old, uh, I'm in a kindergarten on a playground. A lady grabs me. I'm your mother. You're coming with me. I had no idea who she was. Uh, kicking and screaming. Uh, a couple smacks on the head usually shuts you up. Throws me in a car and said, we're going to Arizona. 
Now, I had no idea where Arizona was. We didn't quite get the geography yet in kindergarten. <laughs> and she took a strange route, and we ended up in Michigan, which she called Michigan, and pulled up to a campground, and there's a tent, and she said, this is our home, this is where we're going to live. Now, me being a city boy and all of a sudden never been camping in the woods right on the shore of Lake Michigan, uh, it was very traumatic, but also kind of interesting. But the biggest thing during the next five years was survival. Uh, very little food. Uh, this little campground in Upper Peninsula, Michigan, a little town called Cedar River close by, population 50. I went up there and visited uh, last year, the first time in since those years, and it's still a population of 50. But like I say, the next five years, when the snow started coming, uh, an old flop house somewhere, uh, spring again back in the campground, uh, never really living in the town, school to school. And she did this because my dad was looking for us. And uh, when I was 10 years old, in fact, he did find us in Michigan and went to get the uh, sheriff because there was a warrant out for her. Uh, she grabbed everything we had, threw it in an old Jeep she had, said, now we're going to Arizona. And the reason it took that long, I learned later, because she didn't have the money to make that journey. Huh. So it took six weeks to get to Arizona from Michigan. Uh, she'd go a day, half a day, run out of money for gas, get a job at a, a waitress somewhere, get some tip money, enough to get in the gas tank. And we lived in the car the whole time. Ended up in this little town called Sligman, Arizona, on Old Route 66. If anybody saw the Disney animated movie Cars, Radiator Springs is Sligman, Arizona. That's what they modeled that movie Oh, from. wow. <laughs> yeah, they made a movie. <laughs> but ran outside of town, ran out of gas completely. Uh, a rancher stopped by, what's going on? She explained the situation. He went and got some gas, put it in the car, follow me, you can stay at our house for a while. Little ranch house. And for the next uh, almost six months, that was our home, sleeping on the kitchen floor. Uh, but at least it was covered. If we had heat, it wasn't a tent leaking and so on. And at 10 years old, I uh, got a job, a full-time job as a dishwasher. Uh, and this is, again, old Route 66, so little restaurants all around these little towns. And I watched the gentleman across the street making something, building something, and just out of curiosity, I went over, hi, what are you doing? And he said, what's your name? And I said, my name is Frank. He said, and this is a Mexican gentleman. He said, from now on, you're Pancho, meaning Frank in Spanish. And he said, grab a hammer, kid. Now, I had never had this father figure to teach me any of these type of, of carpentry or anything that dads normally teach young boys. And I said, I don't know what to do, so I'm going to teach you. And he said, when we're done with this, and he's building what they call a snow cap, which is like a Dairy Queen, which even today on Route 66, this little snow cap is iconic. Tour buses from Las Vegas go just to Seligman to see this little snow cap and some of the other historical things in this little town. But Juan became my father figure. He taught me, well, the biggest thing he taught me was work ethic, but he taught me character, integrity. And it was after a couple of years, and we had got an old wreck travel trailer that the rancher got for us and parked behind a motel where my mother was working in the hotel maid. But Juan said, came in one day and he said, Frankly, you can't give back. Now, this is the 50s. Give back is a popular term today. It was not then. Juan, what do you mean give back? The poor people are helping us. Frank, you don't need money to give back. You can give back your time. He gave an example. Look at Mrs. Sanchez, the widow Sanchez. She's always bringing you and your mom beans and tortillas, helping you out. But look at her yard. It's full of weeds. Look at her porch. It needs painting, sanding. You can do that. You can give back. She's helped you. You can help her. And that was that lesson I learned my whole life. When you can, you don't have to have money to help somebody out. You just give back. When somebody needs help, help them. Give back your time. But following that and, and going in, when I started seventh grade, I go home, I see our little trailer being hooked up to a, a pickup with mom, what's going on? She said, I can't afford you anymore. Uh, you're on your own, I, I'm moving. to This little town called Prescott. Well, this would devastate any kid and it did me. And I go to Juan, what do I do? And he said, I heard what's going on. He said, I'm gonna teach you right now. And these are popular words again today. Always turn that negative to a positive. Juan, what do you mean? My, my house just went down the road. <laughs> and he, he said, I arranged with Widow Sanchez that you're going to live with her. And it's going to cost you $20 a week. And he said, you make $26 a week. And every money I ever made went all to my mother. He said, for the first time in your life, you're going to have $6 a week in your pocket. And that's a lot of money for a kid back then. Sure. He said, that's a positive. 
he said the other positive is you live in this old trailer. We didn't even have a running shower. We used to Santa. It was on a Santa Fe railroad line, and the, uh, they would let us use the men's locker room. The kids in town, and he said, for the first time, you're going to have your own room. <laughs> You've got indoor plumbing. Those are positives. He said the biggest positive is she's the best cook in town. No more worry about food. Well, that was a plus. And also, she had the first television set in Seligman, Arizona, Mickey Mouse Club. <laughs> Again, it's mentorship, teaching, integrity, ethics. And he had also introduced me to sports, introduced me to the coaches. And then following in my high school, when I went back to Prescott, Arizona, to be with my mother, she said, I need help. I can't do this. I need you to move here. And again, coaches, teachers, my work employer, everybody just helped me out, given that mentorship, and I always appreciate that. Yeah, I wanna I wanna pause there for a second. So, this whole this whole time, from the time um, that your mom basically kidnapped you when you were five, uh, and, and really through eighth grade and high school, and uh, it was uh, it was a struggle emotionally for you. But from what I've read about you, from what I saw in the movie. Um, you kept pushing on during the, during your childhood, and it's such a unique trait to see in a kid that's such a it's in such a traumatic position. What do you think it was, Frank, that that pushed you along? That um, that that really gave you uh, the internal fortitude? Because I, I do know what kind of um, influence Juan had on you, and I want to talk about him uh, for a little bit as well. I do know what kind of influence and advice he had given you. But there is something internally, right, that has to drive you to be positive during those times. What do you think that was? Yes, and, and again, it went back to one. Never feel sorry for yourself. You're hungry. You only have a half a sandwich today, was his example. But at least you have a half a sandwich. And a lot of people don't have that. But just always, it almost sounds like an army recruiting thing, be the best you can be. Uh, be, the, be the cleanest kid in town. Be the sharpest kid in town. I mean, this is a little town, predominantly Mexican Indian population, a little town of 500. Sure. And, and we all got along together. But be try and always stand out. Be the best you can be. And I remember that also through high school. The teachers tell me the same thing, especially my football, basketball coaches. Stand out. Strive to be the best you can be. Same in the Air Force, everything else. Just that leader, the biggest thing you mentioned, leadership. And it's fortunate to have that leadership. Yeah. Um, we, we talk about on this show a lot, Frank, uh, something that I like to call spark moments. Um, you know, I, I've told my story on the show a little bit. And I want to get into that with you uh, in a little while. Um, but we talk about what I call spark moments. And that that's that are those are these moments in your life where you kind of you either in the moment realize it or you look back and realize that these were pivotal moments, whether they were positive or negative moments, that you sort of uh, chose a path in your life. You chose a direction to go to. Um, and again, be it positive or negative, you know, if it was positive, great. If it was negative, you learned that lesson down the line. But it seemed like you had just a ton of these spark moments throughout your childhood that really defined um, what you were going to be later on. And really, in a, in a way that... Uh, you don't necessarily you couldn't have necessarily predicted this path that you took, you know, because this could have gone the opposite way. This could have totally gone the opposite way. You could have really led a, a horrible, horrible existence in your adult life. But you chose to go in a different path. Um, you know, talk to me about and I I know what I've seen in the movie and I can't wait to read the, the book itself. But talk to me about what kind of influence your father had on you and, and that drive that your father gave you. Well, and, and I didn't know my father that much, uh, except for that ages uh, five to 10, I never really saw him. Um, but he was a hardworking man. He, he worked uh, one of the type things where from high school, just never went to college. But there used to be like Sears Roebuck, there was Montgomery Ward. And right after the war, and he always felt very, very uh, guilty because he was 4F, he could not go into World War II. Um, but it was so, active in other projects relating to the war for drives and so on. But I said, started a uh, Montgomery Ward, but just had that work ethic himself where he ended up with top management position with Montgomery Ward. And uh, when we did reconnect, and, and truth, remember, uh, like you said, the movie's based on a true story. Sure. And in eighth grade, he found me, and in fact came to the town of Sligman, Arizona. And 
uh, brought me a suit and so on to attend my eighth grade graduation. So from that period on, and I had a choice. I could have gone back to Chicago and stayed with him, but I liked where I was at. I didn't like the big towns. I like these little towns. I like, obviously had my coaches, my friends, and so on. But we stayed in touch. But he always, always just such a gentle and caring man. And, and the same thing. And he never said anything negative ever about my mother, which I appreciated. At the time, I didn't realize it. But years later, never never said one word. And I appreciated that. And I always like to follow that by example. Um, but again, just staying in close contact with that man. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's incredible what you, what you kind of... Uh went through and and how you took those influences in your life in order to to remain a positive person um we talked about juan a little bit now what's interesting is for those that that have seen the netflix movie and for those of that have have not seen it yet we're going to share all the links in our show notes later on you have to check out this movie i was so surprised i watched the movie because again our our friend greg um was one of the producers of the movie. It was based on your life story. I got to know you a little bit. And so I made it my wish and my mission that weekend for my wife and I to watch the movie. And I was blown away by how good it was. Uh, and let alone the story itself was, was so incredible. What's interesting is you mentioned Juan and how he came into your life as a father figure. Now, uh, a little factoid about the movie is there's only three people in the movie that you use their real names, right? And it's you, your wife, and Juan, correct? Correct, yes. Right. And that was one of the things I, I begged, I insisted on. Yeah. Uh, luckily for this whole screenplay, I had script approval. Uh, I've worked with Hollywood before. I know how they like to embellish. And that's why it took us so long to, Theo Davies, a director and screenwriter, to write that screenplay because I kept saying, no, uh-uh. <laughs> but one of the things uh, was mentioning Juan's real name, and he said, we can't do that. And I said, wait a minute, I'm still close friends with him. Juan passed away about 10 years ago. Uh -huh. But I'm very good, close friends with the family. And I said, I'll get the permission of the family. Of course, when I asked them, he went, yeah. And what's so neat was the family was on set when we were filming locations in this little town of Sligman, Arizona. And then when we had the Hollywood premiere in June, I made sure they were invited to attend the red carpet. I got to introduce them to the audience because we had a packed house on that. But just... So much, and it was that payback, give back, acknowledge that man, what he did for me, and make that family proud of their father, grandfather. It's so great. Um, you mentioned before, Frank said to you, when you can, I want you to give back. You don't have to have money to give back. And the other piece of advice was always turn, always learn to turn a negative into a positive. Now, on the front end here, um, it looks like one of those motivational posters, those two lines, they're very cliche. But when they're given to you in a situation where somebody is really acting on on uh, their advice and not just giving you advice, they're really living that advice, it has a big influence on you, right? Oh, sure, yes. And, and like, I, I give advice all the time. <laughs> and I tell people, I'm, I'm going to give you a suggestion. I don't say you have to do this. You should do this. I'm going to say, I suggest you do this based on my life experience, especially with nonprofits and that. And then filter it out. Think about what it is. See if it's going to work for you. Filter out. Some of it will. Some of it won't. Go that way. You don't have to do exactly what I say. Just follow the suggestion. See if it works. Yeah, I think it, I think that's a great comment. I, I try and do the same. There, there are quite a few individuals out there that I mentor. Um, and I do it, Frank, because I, I went through a tumultuous period in my life where I wasn't the nicest person. You know, I wasn't uh, a role model and an example. And so when I sort of turned things around and I looked at that period and I learned what not to do, uh, it felt like this mission to go out and to share that story with people and to let them know, um, hey, th these are the mistakes I made. Uh, you can go ahead and make them too if you want. I'm gonna tell you about my experience and that's my advice to you. Um, I want you to avoid them, but you know, in the end, it's your life, right? Uh, exactly, yeah. And so I think that's a real, uh, it's an endearing quality of, of a leader that cares and somebody that's based in servant leadership. Um, and that's something I want to talk about a little bit. You know, there's so many different types of leadership. And we talked about before focusing on the team, but somebody that does something like what you set out to do, and we'll get into the story of that, that, that is the prime example of servant leadership. Um, I want to get into 
the story of, uh, and, and we'll we'll talk about servant leadership. But I want to get into the story of. Um, I guess we were at school. We talked about you uh, being in Prescott um, after high school. You joined the Air Force, right? Yes. And yes. you moved on after the Air Force to work at uh, Motorola. Um, you had clearance, and that's why you were hired for the you. Uh, you worked on the Atlas missile program. I think I read. Yes, at Motorola, um, and this is now in the mid '60s, <laughs> and this is the days of for the college students and everybody else, sex, drugs, rock and roll, right? Hippie bands, everything else. And uh, Motorola came, in fact, to uh, I was stationed in England at the time, but they were sending recruiters all over Europe looking for people that had top secret clearances to work on the uh, government programs, uh, like I said, the Atlas Missile Program, the Titan, and so on, because the majority of engineers graduating from college could not pass a background <laughs> investigation yeah. because of drug use. Sure. And in those days, if you used marijuana at one time, they don't want you. Yeah. You couldn't pass this background. And uh, the majority of them had that were came in there, the... Uh, a top secret clearance, and but I didn't have a college education. But Motorola said fine, and we had to take a long aptitude test. Sure. And for some reason in high school, I was excellent in math, and um, passed that. And then Motorola started sending me to college courses along with my GI Bill, uh, using advantage to to get my education. And Motorola was a great, great place to work for. I mean, I never made so much of it in my whole life. <laughs> And just super good people, long, long hours, long hours on this thing. But again, then it got promoted to, and we had a quality assurance uh, group uh, looking at the components. And my job as an engineer was to try and figure out failure rates of certain components. Uh, after so many user hours, when is this going to fail or is it not on components for the missiles? And again, we had a staff of young ladies working for me. But that goes back to the leadership thing we're talking about earlier is I would join them. I mean, very tedious work, but I would just sit there with them and help them and ask their suggestions how to improve it. It's amazing when you ask the underlings, let's say, you have an idea how this could work better, how we could do it faster? They got those ideas. Oh, yeah. They're working that eight hours a day. Oh, yeah. Motorola, in fact, gave little rewards for that. They would give cash bonuses. They would test out that this is going to work. Wow, look at this. We're going to advance in this program. Give these people a, a cash a bonus. Yeah. Yeah, that's incredible. Tell me what it felt like to to go from living in those trailers, living on somebody's kitchen floor, to becoming a statistical engineer for Motorola where you're testing the failure rates of military part components. Right? Like, what did that feel like? <laughs> well, it, it, it allowed me, uh, along with the GI Bill, to get my first house. I mean, buy a little house. It cost $10,000 back then. <laughs> <laughs> for for a <our> house, <laughs> but uh, it, it just gave me all these advantages. All of a sudden, I got a car that actually worked, and so on. <laughs> but um, all these advantages. But the biggest thing with Motorola, I had to live in Phoenix area. Uh -huh. Now, there's nothing wrong with Phoenix area, except I'm a little city guy. I mean, a little town guy. I didn't like the big city, and even though they were so good to me, I was getting just kind of bored with the position. And several of my high school friends had joined the Arizona Highway Patrol following either high school or college and kept after me. Come on, Frank, with your background, because in the Air Force, I was what they call then Air Police and uh, did OSI investigations and so on. And now, so you're engineering, or you'd be a perfect fit for the Highway Patrol. I said, guys, I make in one week what you guys make in a month. I'm just not going to take that salary cut. But I'm kind of an adrenaline junkie. I looked at this, I kept researching it just on a whim. I put in an application. And at that particular time when they were hiring, they were looking for 50 cadets. Uh, there were 10,000 applicants. Now just imagine that, 10,000 applicants. They only chose 50 because, again, the majority couldn't pass a drug test. They just, again, this is the days. And if even if you then you smoke marijuana once, you're, you're not. And I had never used any type of drugs yeah. ever back then and to this day. So that was the greatest career choice I ever did was to get the highway patrol. And um, my first assignment was a little town called Yuma, Arizona, as a car officer. And while down there, I would continue my, my college classes. And the football coach came up one day and he said, Frank, he said, have you ever heard of Special Olympics? And I said, no, coach, I haven't. 
He said, well, first of all, I knew your high school football coach, and that's how I recognize your name. And he said, but Special Olympics, I'd like you to start teaching with these kids. And he explained the program, and I thought, well, God, Coach, that sounds like kind of fun. And on my off-duty time, I'd teach these kids a basketball throw, softball throw, football throw. I had so much fun with these kids. And one day, I was just kind of laughing with these young boys, and I'm oops, one, I think I'm starting to give back. This was the first opportunity that I ever had since those days to start giving back. Yeah. Which is really enjoyed that program. And that's when I started the whole thing of working with the children. Yeah. Wow. Incredible. Uh, <clears throat> and so there was a day, that fateful day, when you were involved in a high speed chase uh, at 85 miles an hour with a drunk driver, right? Uh, and another drunk driver, if I'm correct, cut in front of you and you broadsided him and crashed, right? Yeah, I was told to crash this like that. <laughs> the, the, the highway patrol, um, and I was still down in the Yuma area, and they started, and they're going to start a 10 man motorcycle tactical unit. It was going to work the whole state of Arizona. Yeah. And in fact, our training, our initial training was with California Highway Patrol uh, in California. And our equipment was identical. Our uniforms were almost identical, except obviously our state of Arizona. But, uh, and we would work two man teams. We'd be, uh, in town, just like chips, and this chips became very popular during this period. And for the people that don't recognize that name, it was about the adventures of two California Highway Patrol motorcycle officers, Ponch and John, and and it was very popular with the, the younger kids. The demographics of that show was about seven years old to 15, 20 for the boys, and seven years old to about 50 or 60 for the women because of Ponch, <laughs> Eric Estrada. <laughs> such a charismatic guy yeah but um we were the whole team was sent to little town of park arizona population 2000 during spring break became 80,000 because all the college kids again the sex drugs rock and roll yep fatal crashes accidents rapes homicides i mean just going on and on and like you mentioned a high-speed chase with 25 mile on his own uh, 85 with a drunk driver another drunk driver pulled in front of me i couldn't do what they call break and escape maneuver I uh, hit him broadside, and like I said, they said the crash was spectacular and pronounced dead at the scene. And by some, whatever you call it, stroke of God, miracle, uh, there was an off-duty nurse on the road uh, that pulled over and tried to resuscitate you, performed CPR for four minutes, and saved your life. Exactly, exactly. I mean, uh, every police officer I ever worked with, including myself, believes in a higher being. I don't, I don't care what religion it might be. Yep. And we always say a little prayer. We go to work. Uh, please allow me to come home, get home at night. Thank you for allowing me to come home. And I believe in the garden angel concept, I guess you want to say. But I, I've never imagined this angel with the white gown coming down on wings and so on. People are, are guardian angels as sure. far as I'm concerned. And this one was sent down in the form of an off-duty emergency room nurse. Who, like you said, performed the CPR on me, and uh, you and I are talking, so obviously brought me back to life. <clears throat> and that resulted in a skull fracture, massive brain injury, broken bones, missing skin. It took a long time to recover on that. And uh, going to counseling and following that to make sure my head was right to go back to work, the counselor said to me, Frank, God spared you for a reason, and now it's up to you to find that reason. And I can't imagine that this was something where you could just jump back in, um, you know, once your rehab was over and just feel the same way you felt the day before the accident. Um, you know, uh, an experience like that, a near death, or really a death experience, not a near death experience. You you had said your partner tried to resuscitate you unsuccessfully and actually called in a, is it called a 963 eh? Yeah, 963, the officer killed in the line of duty. Officer killed in the line of duty. Yeah, and, uh, and you mentioned he tried to resuscitate me, too. Now, when I went to counseling, um, the counselor said, we talked about going through the tunnel, which I didn't realize uh, when people die. And this happens to an ER room situation a lot. Uh, your light starts going away, like you look at the end of the tunnel, all of a sudden it closes. As you're brought back to life, that little light opens and it comes back. <laughs> and she said, do you recall anything, what your senses were? Because your senses start coming back. And I said, well, <clears throat> and I never thought about this before. I said, I recall the sense of smell, something, something very sweet, something real nice. Uh, the sense of hearing, I can hear my partner yelling. She brought him back, she brought him back. I can hear sirens. He's alive. What are they talking about? Uh, 
the, the sense of touch, something is tickling my face, um, something is on my lips, the sense of sight. I open my eyes and here's this beautiful blonde with a lip lock on me. <laughs> and if this is having a, this is okay, I'm fine. Now you mentioned my partner. I learned that he tried to resuscitate me. Now if I would have woken up to him, big ugly guy, <laughs> bushes and stash full of bugs, I probably would have just went back under. So. <laughs> That was definitely a stroke of luck. <laughs> um, and so you go back to the line of duty after however long your rehab was. Two years later, you met Chris. Uh, and so tell the story of, of how that all came about. Well, again, because of the television show Chips, um, again, very popular with the kids. And in fact, we would go into these little towns and all of a sudden the grade school kids are as we be these little towns. Hey, Ponce, hey, John, hey, Chips. <clears throat> it was great fun with the kids. And in fact, we started in our off-duty time, our slow time. We'd go to the grade schools to talk about bicycle safety. The kids could care less. They wanted to get on the motorcycles, which was fine. It was great PR. Uh, all of a sudden, they're not afraid of cops anymore. And worked a lot with the kids. But then, like I say, it was 1980. Now, this accident happened in 1978. 1980, I'm way up in northern Arizona. I'm, I'm a solo by myself up there on motorcycle duty. And I get a call from the dispatcher. I need you to check find check out at a 21, meaning you need to go to a phone somewhere. Uh, this is before cell phones or internet or anything else. And she said, we have emergency traffic that does not involve your family. Closest phone was about 40 miles away. I call in. She said, the Highway Patrol has just been informed about a seven-year-old boy named Chris. Chris's heroes are Ponch and John from the television show Chips. And he told his mother, when I grow up, I'm going to be a Highway Patrol motorcycle officer. And he also said Chris has leukemia and only about a week or two to live. And they've asked if the Highway Patrol can arrange for him to meet a motorcycle officer. And your commanders want you to be that motorcycle officer that he meets. And maybe it's because I was working with these kids for all these years all over the state. And you're authorized to go code two, drive code two down to Phoenix, which is about 100 miles away. Um, police language in there means I can break all the traffic rules <laughs> and not get a complaint out of it Perfect. because I've got a mission. Not red lights and siren, but just passing, no passing zones, etc. Right. Always kind of fun for us to run that <laughs> type thing. But they timed it, and I never met this little boy. I had no idea what to expect. They timed it where the helicopter, which picked him up at his uh, hospital and flew him to our headquarters in Phoenix, where it was I was approaching the landing zone, they had the helicopter coming in. And I could see this little kid's face pressed against the, the glass on the helicopter. It's just this big grin. Helicopter lands, and I thought our paramedics were going to help him out. Door opens up, this little pair of red sneakers jumps out, runs over the motorcycle. Hi, I'm Chris. Just this grip and grin on his face. Now, he had just come off IVs. And his doctor who was with him also is kind of looking concerned. This little kid is running all over. Can I get on a motorcycle? Well, of course you can, Chris. Now, he had watched ships so much. And again, our equipment was identical, our motorcycles. This is the red lights, got to turn it on. These are the flashers. This is the siren. What's in your saddlebag? The same as Punch. He is just laughing and giggling. I'm looking at his mother, and she's crying. Why, why is she crying? Then it dawned on me, she has her seven-year-old back. He's not laying in a hospital bed. He forgot he was dying. But Chris went on that day to become the first and only honorary high patrol officer. At that time, um, with complete, we had a custom-made uniform made for him, uh, the smoky hat, the whole thing. The biggest thing for him was his motorcycle wings, which made him a motorcycle officer. And unfortunately, a couple days after that, Chris passed away. And I was like, I think maybe those wings helped carry him to heaven. And my commander said, We've learned that Chris is going to be buried in a little town called Kewanee, Illinois. We have lost a fellow officer. I would like you and your partner to go back into Illinois and give him a full police funeral, wow. which we did. Now, again, before days of, of uh, Internet or anything, but the TV stations started picking us up. We're met in Chicago by all the major networks. They followed us down to the little town of Kewanee. They had spread the word to the state police, the city police, the county police, Illinois State Police, the county, the city police, all met us in this little town, give them this little boy a full police funeral. He was buried in uniform. His grave marker reads, Chris Gracious, Arizona Trooper. But flying home, I just started thinking, here's a boy who had a wish, and we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? 
And that's when the idea of the Make-A-Wish Foundation was born, maybe 36,000 feet over Kansas or somewhere. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. And, and I, I did read somewhere that uh, Chris took a turn for the worse, and this was actually in the movie as well. Uh, Chris took a turn for the worse, and you were called. Uh, you made your way to the hospital when the wings were ready, and when you pinned the wings on him, he came out of his coma shortly? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah it was, it's, it's, it's like a scene out of a movie, which it is. <laughs> which it but, was, yeah. Yeah, his uniform was hanging right by his bed. He's in a coma. Just as I pinned on those wings that were very important to him, he came out of a coma. Just a very weak voice. Am I a motorcycle officer now? Yes, you are, Chris. His wish had become true. And he asked for his uniform. He's rubbing the wings. He showed his mom a big hug, and a couple hours later, he passed away. Unreal. This episode is sponsored by the new cohort of the Leadership Experience. Unconventional leadership brought to you by yours truly, the launch dad himself, George Andriopoulos. Our new cohort is starting soon, and not only do we still have the same four courses, that's right, the public thought leadership track, the career leader track, the entrepreneurship track, and of course, the podcast experience, we have our first graduate level up level inimitable the newest one-on-one -on -one leadership class this is for not only if you have taken the leadership experience core class before and are ready to graduate to the newest level but for those that have experienced leadership and want to take it to a new level inimitable is for you i'm not even going to talk about it in this commercial you're gonna to have to contact me check out the leadership exp dot com for details and to sign up for information inimitable is coming at you dm me for more info later guys so after chris was buried um and you flew back to to arizona and you came up with this concept um i read somewhere that that uh, when when Chris had said to you, I wish I could be a motorcycle officer, that was really the first time that you acknowledged uh, the power of the word wish, right? Well, that's the first time I heard the word wish uh, from that little boy. And yeah. he just kind of stuck back in there and that he had a wish. And that, that's why when coming home, I started thinking about it. he had a wish that we made it happen. Why can't we do that for other children? Yeah. Now, this... make a wish that we'll make it happen. This is something that that's important to me. I, I've I've read a couple of interviews. I've watched uh, and listened to a few interviews that be, you've been part of, and you mentioned specifically how that plane ride. That's where the idea for Make a Wish was born. Um, can you get into that a little further? I, I'm I'm so curious um, as to how that process went for you. Like just how the genesis of starting that foundation or 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 whatever the initial idea was happened to you. I know for me, um, I, I get these moments, you know, when I decide that I'm going to do something. Uh, I started a nonprofit um, about nine years ago. I co-founded a nonprofit. I've been involved with some amazing, amazing organizations. And when I get some of these wacky ideas, uh, it, it's really interesting to think about what my thought process was. So I'd love to hear what that was like for you on that plane ride. Well, and, and a very traumatic, uh, again, experience in this little boy. Uh, and not only was I on this motorcycle tax squad to work the whole state, I was always, already always on a 10-man fatal team that the Highway Patrol developed. They sent us to the greatest training all around the nation to try for fatal, the uh, horrific fatal accidents where a, uh, I want to say, I don't want to put this down, the average patrolman is trained to do this, but without that expertise training, it will take him two to three weeks to investigate this fatal accident, this, this horrific fatal accident. And it keeps him off the road during that time. Sure. And they got this 10-man team. We worked in, in two-man uh, units where we would go in there and we could get that done in a week because of the training that we had. And, again, horrific. And so many of those were with children. Um the, any any fatal accident is, is traumatic to you, but especially when it involves a child, especially when you're a parent yourself and you have the children of that same age. And to all of a sudden, we're with Chris interacting so much. And what a neat little kid that loves motorcycles, right? I mean, we <laughs> bonded immediately. <laughs> but all of a sudden, that there might be this program where we could help these kids. And... When we started the Make-A-Wish Foundation for children with terminal illnesses, uh, 
Leukemia was the death sentence. Uh, these children did not survive. Uh, very fortunately, about 25 years ago, they changed the mission with children with life-threatening illnesses because through the grace of God and modern medicine, more and more of these children are surviving the, these cancers and so on. But all of a sudden, it just gives some joy to children instead of just seeing them die, holding them in your arms all this time, all these years. gives some joy to these children. And, and that's what the drive and even the thought process, oh, it's not going to happen. Uh, it's like Juan has tapped me on the side of the head. Frank, turn that negative to the positive. Make it work. And, and But again, just to give back somehow to these kids. Yeah, and, and so you went ahead with that idea. Um, I'd love to hear when you got home what this was like. And, and can you tell me a little bit about, because I know the story of Kitty in the movie, but I'd love to hear... Uh, if that was the actual story, if there was a, a different story with how you met your wife, Kitty. Well, based on a true story. <laughs> based on, yeah, yeah. So give me the, had, give me the Cliff's had, notes for Kitty. <laughs> I had gone through a divorce several years earlier, and Kitty was actually our traveling secretary. Well, we had a whole ten man unit uh, in one place. She would travel with us. She would type up all the reports. She would get them to the courts. She knew. She knew all us guys, and. It was just a friendship. But when I had this accident, and like the show in the movie, um, in this little town of Parker, it was just a clinic, not a hospital, about 180 miles away from Phoenix, too injured to even get me flown down there. And they put me in a hotel room. They didn't have hospital rooms. And they said, we need somebody to stay with him for the next night or two to make sure he doesn't go into shock. And we did that in the movie. And the movie says the first time we met. No, we knew each other. <clears throat> but she did. And that's when, after that, we kind of started noticing each other a little bit. Yeah. And so she didn't let me go into shock. Now we've been married for 30-some years. And she says, you know what? Sometimes I wish I would let you go into shock. <laughs> <laughs> I can but understand that. that. We started that romantic relationship from that incident. Yeah. So a lot happened from that. Not only lived, but met Kitty and uh, started the foundation all because of that accident. Well, I'll tell you that we, we have a lot of parallels, and this is sort of a, a, a full circle moment here because I have a little bit of a story. So you went on to become the first president and CEO um, of, of Make-A-Wish Foundation, and then you sort of handed over the reins saying uh, we need to give this to professionals that know what they're doing better, and you went into an ambassador role for a time. Um, and so this organization went on to grant, uh, I think, over a half a million wishes and, and really – change the world. And so I'll tell you a little bit about myself, if you don't mind, Frank, um, and, and, and tell you where we parallel here. And so uh, I've told this story a, a million times on this podcast, but basically um, I, I went through a, a divorce almost 10 years ago, nine years ago now, um, and I wasn't, uh, wasn't the greatest person before that. I really focused a lot on my career and making money, and uh, uh, my focus wasn't in the right place. And so one thing led to another and, and the other shoe fell and I kind of find my found myself in this place of just um, rock bottom loneliness, right? And so that year I uh, was introduced to a, to a really unique situation. Uh, an acquaintance of mine, a uh, 15 year old girl who um, went to the same karate school that I went to, did karate as a hobby, was diagnosed with rhabdoid cancer. Her name was Shannon Sirks. And so Shannon... Uh, when I had found out I was in the pharmacy industry during the first half of my career and heard about this and something called out to me. And I said, I really, uh, I think I need to get involved. Um, and so I called a few of my friends that knew Shannon well, and we, you know, sort of went into action, uh, came up with some ideas. And one thing led to another, and we had decided to start a foundation um, to aid not only her, but children like her. Um, we did this all in secret because we wanted to surprise uh, Shannon with this. And so this is sort of where my mentality started changing when I got into this role of, of doing something for other people rather than just myself. Um, Shannon was an incredible human being who brought me so much in my life. We had decided to take a quick weekend trip. She was, uh, she was moved upstate to a rehab facility. Um, she had lost the use of her legs and partial use of her arms and everything. And um, we took an impromptu trip upstate New York to, to visit her 
And she said, hey, guys, so I've been talking to the Make-A-Wish people because that's how serious it was. And, uh, you know, they've been asking me for a few days what I would like for my wish. And, you know, do you want to go to Disney? Do you want to go to the Super Bowl? Do you want to do this and that? And she said, no, no, you know, I don't really want any of that stuff. She was a selfless person. And she said to them, I'd like to start a foundation to help people like me. And we said, well... Um, surprise, we just registered for Shannon's Fight, a 501c3 that's going to be aiding families of children in medical crisis financially. Um, and so it was such an incredible moment because I saw this person who was using her wish, right, that she could have had anything in the world and she wanted to help other people with it. And I think that was the very moment that my life completely changed where I knew that I had to be the person that I, I always wanted to be, you know, um, and subsequently, um, Shannon got better for a while and then, um, her cancer came back, uh, and she was, you know, diagnosed as terminal and make a wish came back around again. And what she did was she asked for a trip to Taiwan. Uh, her, her mother is, um, uh, Taiwanese, uh, asked for a trip to Taiwan because, you know, uh, Western medicine was was failing them at the time. They wanted to give a shot to some Eastern medicine and visit her her grandmother in Taiwan. And and they had this family trip that was unbelievable. Uh, Make a wish also paid for a photo shoot because Shannon was 17 at the time and didn't uh, knew that she would never get married. And so she wanted to have a wedding photo shoot with her family, with her mother and father and her two sisters. Um, sorry. Uh, and so. Um, you know, the, this whole experience of what Make-A-Wish gave to her was uh, was so incredible for the family. Um, for me, uh, going through the whole experience, this, this really traumatic experience and coming out the other side with this greater understanding of giving back and how much it matters um, was huge uh, because it not only gave me a new perspective on life and a new mission on life, uh, it also gave me, after my divorce, I met uh, Shannon's sister, Colleen, which I eventually married and, <laughs> and now we have been married for two years. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's, it's really crazy to think how giving back just has this exponential growth, right? You start this foundation, uh, all these years ago and, you know, 30 something years later affected our lives, and caused this huge change in in her life, in my life, that set me down this incredible path. Uh, and so it was really just unbelievable when I got to speak to you and and, and meet you over the phone and, and hear um, and talk to you about these experiences because I want you to understand what an effect you've had on on people's lives. Well, and it's called the ripple effect, yes, too. It's yes, exactly what happened to you, a ripple effect. And it, it's happened constantly for over 40 years right now. <clears throat> now, I wish I had an assistant. Because of this movie, uh, DVD sales, and then when it went on Netflix, I get, and I'm not boasting, I'm very flattered this, 40 to 50 emails every day, either Facebook, private messages, emails, whatever it might be, through my website, about what an impact the movie made on them, and the majority of these are related somehow to make a wish. Either a, a wish recipient themselves, uh, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, mother, father, grandfather, and I, I try and answer those, but it's just this ripple effect that you never realize I, I did in a sense, but all of a sudden this made how many lives we have touched. And I'm getting these from all over the world, not just the U.S. I just started receiving them from Africa, from New Zealand, Australia, because we have chapters in all of these countries. It's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. That ripple effect is exactly the reason why I do what I do in my life. Um, so people like you that are real life examples, Frank, of, of the, the good that that ripple effect can affect, uh, it's incredible. It's, it's really, really incredible. And the fact that you, you're gracious enough with your time to come on a show like this to, to discuss it with people because I would like to think, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I would love to think that 20 years from now, this interview sparked or activated leadership in somebody out there that is going to change the world, you know, and that's what, that's what this whole thing is about. 
Um, so, uh, let's get to, um, some of the interesting stories, uh, that I've heard. Um, so we talked about the first unofficial wish that you granted with Chris, uh, but tell us a little bit about the first official wish that you granted with, uh, with Frank, I believe was his name, right? Yes. Uh, Frank Bopsy Salazar, Bopsy middle name. Yep. And a little Mexican boy, seven years old, the same thing with Chris, leukemia, only a short time to live. And um, now we're official. We're, we, we got official in November of 1980, uh, our 501c3. In March of 1981 is when we had enough money and organized enough. We're going to grant our first official wish. And this little boy uh, lived in a very poor town in the Phoenix area, uh, still dirt streets, dirt floors in the houses, uh, outhouses, no inside plumbing. And went out to, I borrowed a patrol car and I was in uniform. I was his wish grantor. I was the one that would interview him to find out what his wish might be. Uh, would he like to have something, be something, do something, see something, those four categories. And mom, a single mom, very embarrassed for me to come in the house because of the dirt floors. And I said, wait a minute, you didn't know where I used to live as a kid. <laughs> but no, so I, I had Bopsy in a patrol car. And he got a big kick out of it because our name was both Poncho in Spanish, Frank. Yeah. And he was somewhat stoic. He was going through the Catholic Church, his, his change into manhood. For, he was a Yaqui Indian, uh, Mexican Yaqui Indian, so in that particular uh, phase of his religion. And he didn't want to show a lot of expression. So I said, well, if there's something you want to do, have DC. And he looked at me, he says, I want, and he's in a patrol car. He says, I want to be a fireman. I said, wait a minute, you're in a highway patrol car and you want to be a fireman? Well, got a little laugh out of that. And I started thinking, well, that's got to be easy because my mom, now my wife, my girlfriend, Kitty at the time, her brother was a Phoenix fireman. And I'm sure he would help us pull that off. And he says, no, I want to ride in a hotter balloon. And I thought, wow, that's easy. My friends in Prescott, where I grew up, have a hot air balloon. And then he said, no, I want to go to Disneyland. Now, that threw me a little bit because we hadn't thought about an out-of-state travel wish, per se. So I said, well, let me go back to the board and, and talk about it. And a child only gets one wish. That's in our charter. That's still in effect today. Went to the board, and I said, what I'd like to do is break the charter immediately and grant all three wishes. We're going to get so much press out of this. It's going to get us on the map, not just in Arizona, but nationwide. And the Phoenix Fire Department came through. I mean, what a great day they set for him, complete with a custom-made turnout suit his size, sliding down the fire pole. Um, it was in March. He's got one of the ladder trucks in downtown Phoenix, spraying all the cars. It was a beautiful day. The people come out. What? Did it rain? <laughs> the hotter balloon was the same thing, and the press is picking all this up. I went to the board, and I said, now, the Disney thing, and I told the secretary, which was Kitty, she was our secretary, uh -huh. one of the founders also, and I said, call Disney, see what you can arrange here, and we'll get enough money, hopefully, to send this over. She keeps calling Disney, Disney, and they would not talk to her. Now, what we learned later, she was saying we're the Make-A-Wish Foundation, we'd like to send this little boy over, terminal illness, if we could get free admission, and just get him to the front of the lines. He's very ill, he's in a wheelchair, and we learned later they get these bogus requests all the time. And, and now this is 1981. So, and she said, I don't know what to do. They won't talk to me. I said, well, let me call them. And I called over there and the direct, got the secretary, director of public relations. And I didn't say this is Frank Shanklin's president of the Make Wish Foundation. I said, this is Officer Frank Shanklin's Arizona Highway Patrol. I can almost imagine this. There's a little pause that this guy set it up a little straight. And she said, well, what is this about? I said, I have a warrant for one of your people. Well, guess who I got to talk to? <laughs> the director of public relations. Now, Disney doesn't like this story, but they've, I've told it at some of their big conventions. They get a little laugh. Yeah. They're very protective of their brand, right? Sure. But I got the gentleman on the phone, and the first thing I said was, I just lied to you. I said, I am with Arizona Highway Patrol. I do not have a warrant. Here's my name. Here's my badge number. Here's my supervisor's name and phone number. All you have to do is call him, and I will be terminated immediately. But will you please listen to my story? Well, he listened to my story, fortunately. And because of that, started that relationship with Disney for now over 40 years. I mean, just hundreds of millions of dollars that Disney has, has helped with our children's donations, everything else. So I like to tell people, sometimes you got to lie a little bit 
but qualified that lie right away. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, and so and so they went rolling on to to grant uh, hundreds of thousands of wishes um, after that. And there are so many people out there uh, that pride themselves on being top wish granters. Uh, I know John Cena is one of the top wish granters. Uh, Dwayne Johnson was one of them. Um, you know, so incredible how uh, these different communities have mixed to to really help to to create change in the world. Uh, I want to move on to the story and how this was retold. And so you had the opportunity. Um, I think you were, you were approached by Greg Reed about uh, your story, right? For the movie or you tell me how, how did this all well, go? I, I had, um, I still act of homicide. I eventually left Howard patrol and went into our criminal investigation division working first narcotics and then homicide where I spent majority of my career. I spent 42 years total with uh, the state police. And um, I had met a young lady, uh, Clarissa Burt, who was a model. We were doing a event up here in Prescott. And she said, you need to meet this guy named Greg Reed. And I said, well, I don't know who that is. Next day, I get a call from Greg. I'm Greg Reed. I'm flying you over to San Diego. I want to talk to you. Now, I don't know who this guy is. And I said, no, thank you. And he kept calling. So finally, I did a wants and Morris check on this guy. Is this a relative of somebody I put in prison or whatever? And he's clean. <laughs> And who doesn't like San Diego, right? <laughs> so, okay, got some days off, flew over there, and that started this greatest relationship. He just started talking to me for a couple hours. He handed me a dollar bill. He said, someday I'm going to make you wealthy. Well, I haven't quite done that yet, but <laughs> <laughs> it just started this great relationship. And he asked me, he said, how much do you charge for speaking events? And I said, well, I speak for Make-A-Wish all over the nation, literally as far as away as Saipan, Guam, and so on. I don't charge, just my foundation. Yeah. He said, no, I want you to start speaking at paid events. And I never thought about this. So, again, a mentor at my age, and this is in uh, 2011, to start this whole new career, uh, attended a couple of events. He said, you are just knocking them off. I want you to be involved in the documentary I'm making. We're going to interview on stage and be part of this documentary. He said, okay, great. And I'm doing this, and... Some of it was set up, the audience reaction and that. And the director afterwards came over, Theo Davies, introduced himself. He said, I've never seen an audience reaction like I've seen with you. And he says, we need to make a movie about your life. I said, no, you don't. He said, yes, we do. <laughs> and I thought they meant a documentary. He said, no, a feature film. A feature film. And then he got Greg involved, and he, Greg became the producer of the film. Long story short, six years later, we had a movie out called Wishman. But again, it was all because of just a chance meeting with Greg and then him mentoring me and look what it led to. Yeah. Uh, side note on that is Greg Greg is just an incredible human being that, that is based in service. I met Greg in, in a sort of a uh, uh, unique situation where uh, I host a, a TEDx here in, in my hometown of Farmingdale on top of being a, a keynote and TEDx speaker myself. Um, and so uh, there was an individual that told a story. He was a brand new speaker, totally green, and, and told a story about um, how Greg changed his life uh, and, and turned him around into a person that became somebody who was always looking for counsel and um, uh, in order to build his intuition and help him make better choices. And when he told me this story about Greg, um, as I worked with him, as I mentored him on his speaking and helped him cultivate his first TED Talk, uh, I reached out to Greg one day and I said, hey, um, just through his website email, I said, hey, you know, I, I figured you would just want to know this, but this individual that you invited to your house in San Diego um, and, and gave this life changing advice to, he's doing it. He's doing it and he's doing a TED Talk. It's one of his life goals. And I figured if I mentored somebody, I would want to know when they succeed. And so I just want to let you know. And wouldn't you know, he called me five minutes later. <laughs> called me on my cell phone five minutes later. How can I be of service? And so we've we've developed a friendship as well, and it led to to meeting you. So um, now the film itself, uh, I will tell you my honest opinion here, Frank. I, I wanted to watch it because of Greg. I wanted to watch it because of you, and and of course in preparation for this interview, um, I expected a great story, a feel good story, and I expected it to be 
because it wasn't a you know a, a big budget theatrical release kind of movie, I, I expected it to be a, a B movie in terms of acting. And I I can't even tell you how. Not only was the story just completely amazing and such an amazing plot to the story, but the acting too. I mean, this was this is an A plus to me. I mean, I was sobbing watching this with my wife and and thoroughly satisfied uh as as a person that loves movies um i don't sit here and rate movies but it was incredible man uh you you guys did a phenomenal job everybody that that was on it um did just a phenomenal job with this well and and during of course like I said, the whole pre-production that was that was five years just in pre-production but when we finally started filming in 2017 uh, we got the cast and crew together and I think everything comes together, not only just, well, I mean, Theo Davies, the director, was the one that just brings that whole, meshes everything together. But the team beforehand, uh, selecting the actors uh, and the crew, and three days in, I could see where this is going to, everything's going to mesh together. I've worked with Hollywood before, I've worked with directors, uh, you know, the boss stomping and this and that. Theo was, everybody wanted to work for Theo. Yeah. Because he doesn't, he, he'd always say, it. now we're going to do it this way. But you know what? If you have a better way, let me know. Let's talk about it. And so many people just collaborated on this thing to get it done. Andrew Steele, the young Australian actor who played me, I had met him just by chance. I was speaking at an event in Hollywood. Uh, he came up to me and just started talking. He says, hey, I want to start a nonprofit over here in Hollywood. What are some of the steps? We're talking. And somebody came up to me and said, Frank, when you're, we're going to just audition pretty soon. For the female lead, and he said, what are they talking about? I told him, he said, well, I'm an actor in Australia. I've got several lead roles over there. I said, well, throw your hat in the ring, go audition. Now, nobody gave him the part. He had to work for it. <clears throat> but he got that audition. But then for the next year and a half, this gentleman worked so hard, working with me, working with my mannerisms, came with my little town, just hung out for a couple weeks. And even on set every day, so many people be taking breaks. When he's taking a break, he's got the script in front of him. Yeah. Look for the next lines. Always coming up because I was a technical advisor, consulting producer on the film. How should I do this? What do you think I should do on this? Give me ideas. And I felt so good. And all the actors did that. Every actor on there, and especially Theo, come up. Okay, we're going to do this. Do you see any changes? Can we do this? Should we? And I come up sometimes and suggest it. We're going to do that. I suggest it. And he wouldn't just say no. He'd say, no, Frank, and this is the reason why. Sure, sure. Yeah. Again, and that's why he meshed with all of these actors on there. Yeah, and he had so many fun actors, especially Larry Wilcox, who chips. I mentioned chips. Robert Pine, who plays my motorcycle sergeant. I was looking for that character that had that same personality as my true motorcycle sergeant, and I knew Larry Wilcox. I met him several years ago, and I kept thinking Robert Pine is perfect on the show. He had that same personality. Larry contacted Robert. Robert read the screenplay, said, "I want this." He auditioned for it. He got it. We're good friends today. The three of us like to hang out. Oh, that's great. That's great. Let me yeah. ask you, speaking of, speaking of the actors, because this was an interesting question that I had. What was it like um, teaching Andrew Steele how to be Frank Shankowitz? <laughs> I don't know if I taught so much, but he just observed. Uh, the biggest thing was, well, we had to send him, first of all, through motorcycle training. He had not ridden motorcycles. And then when he finished regular motorcycle training, we got a retired CHP motorcycle officer over in California to work with him to teach him the, the police way of riding a motorcycle. Nothing against the civilians, but there's sure. a whole difference sure, sure. <laughs> on there. And then weapons training. But the biggest thing was the dialect because he had, obviously, that Australian accent. And he worked and worked on that. Now, he forgot. He went back to Australia a couple of times, and he forgot the time zone between Australia and Arizona. <laughs> And at 3 in the morning, I would get a call, conference call between him and a dialogue coach. Frank, I need to read this line. He'd read the line, dialogue coach would say, I'd read the line first, then he'd read it. Dialogue coach would say, you got to do your accent, your implication just a little bit better. And it was so much fun working with him. That's and great. then just hanging out, the walk, the talk, smoke. He didn't smoke cigars. <laughs> yeah. And I'm a cigar smoker, so we <laughs> <laughs> smoked a lot of cigars. Yeah, I don't. Uh, I don't know the. Uh, uh, I don't know the real people here, but the way this was cast was just. It, it was so well done. Uh, Kirby Bliss Blanton that played Kitty uh, was great in the movie, uh, and then some of the some of the names that we know, like Tom Sizemore playing Sergeant Mason, was was awesome. Uh, 
him and and Frank Wally, you just like love to hate them in the movie. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. They yeah, were incredible, and, and, uh, especially Tom Sizemore. You mentioned now, Tom Sizemore. Uh, every day on set, he would always have a football on his arm because he was going to be a pro football player, and an injury stopped that. Oh, I didn't but know. he also liked to have a football. And when we're doing in locations in downtown Preston on the courthouse plaza area, all grass and everything, a lot of the kids from town I was here watching the movie. Pretty soon when we had breaks, he'd be playing football with the kids. And they just love it. They just That's love great. It. That's great. Down to and they're all like that. Everybody. Uh Danny Trejo. I was gonna say. Oh my gosh. Up in little town of Seligman, uh <laughs> still population five hundred. And majority of ranchers and Indian reservation, they come into school. So there's maybe 20, 30 kids total live in the town. And they would be on that set. And he would just joke around, have fun with them. Then he would go over the character and scare the hell out of them. <laughs> scare the hell out of everybody. And well, then the scene break, and he'd go back to just regular Danny laughing. And the kids had so much fun. He's signing autographs. Just a true gentleman. That's Machete right there. He's a legend. Hey, yeah. <laughs> It's yeah, a still, legend. Still stay in contact with him. <laughs> That's great. Um, I want to talk a little bit about before we we wrap up. Uh, so this is this is an interesting question. You 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 have this uh, your biography. You have this movie that's really a, a legacy of your life. And I think what was really smart about the movie was um, I went in expecting a story of Make a Wish movie, and that's not at all what it was. This was the story of. Frank Shankowitz, uh, and I don't want to give anything away, but you know that that name isn't even mentioned until the last couple of minutes of the movie, really. Um, and so uh, I thought it was done so so honestly, and it was just so many smart choices in the movie. Um, what I'm interested in is when you watch this thing for the first time, and I don't I don't mean through edits and uh, that process. I mean you sit down for the first time to watch this. Um, what was that feeling like? You know, I, I, there, there are a few words that come to my mind. It really depends how you feel about it. But was it cathartic? Was, was it a proud moment? Were there regrets in looking for, you know, at certain moments of your life? Talk to me about that. Well, and again, I was on set every day as technical advisor, consultant, producer. And a lot of times, it's so surreal to watch somebody. I mean, I'm watching a scene. I'm very emotionally watching a scene. I don't about me, but I'm watching the scene, and all of a sudden, wow, that's me that they're doing. It, it just, and some of it was laughter, a lot of times it's little tears, and uh, especially when they recreate the death scene, and the gals on his, uh, we call it Video Village, all the gals in there, and uh, the crew, are you okay? I said, well, it must be the dust out here or something, I'm getting <laughs> tears yeah. my eyes. <laughs> just to watch all that, and, and real quick, if we have time, we talk about the ripple effect, uh, I work with the script supervisor. Uh, we were usually the first one was on the set every day. Uh, we would we would look at the set for the day. We'd look at the script. We'd look at the continuity, etc. And lovely young lady named Kenny Del Toro, and she knew who I was. She knew what the movie was about. The third day in, when everybody's kind of meshing, get to know each other, uh, get in there. Good morning, Kennedy. She comes up, give me a hug, to start crying. And I mean, really crying. Kennedy, what's wrong? What happened? I'm a wish child. I mean. Now people are coming in when she's telling her story. Everybody is crying with just that ripple effect. That, um, and again, she wasn't supposed to survive at 11 years old. Her wish was to go to Hollywood uh, to learn how to be an actress. At 17, she went into remission, make a wish. New Mexico sent her to Hollywood to go to acting school. During school, she became more interested in the technical side. And after school, they asked her if she would be an intern uh, for the summer and uh, as a script supervisor. And she said, well, yeah, I'd like to try that. Halfway through the year, the director script supervisor did show up a couple days. The director said, she's fired, you're hired. <laughs> this young lady is all over the world just because of a wish. And I made sure when we had the premiere in Hollywood that she was invited, her and her boyfriend was also one of the crew members, and identified her, brought her up to stage so people could meet her and what the effect of a Make-A-Wish Foundation has on people. That's incredible. But then to see it for the first time, I'd seen it in little TV settings and that, but the Hollywood premiere was the first time we saw it. A lot of us on the big, big screen, the sound. And all of a sudden, I'm realizing what the director was looking for in its sound, in the color, in the camera angles, and that you could see it on the big screen different than you can see it on television. And I, I, we thought, we all thought, well, you hear this a lot, we're filming. I think we got something special here. I think 
this low budget film is something special. When you see it then on a big screen, wow. And we've got all sorts of awards. We've won a couple of film festival awards, but the biggest thing, an honor to that cast and crew and everybody is when we became qualified for Academy Award for Best Picture with the big boys. <laughs> We didn't make the top 10, but they even be considered with those big boys. That's a big deal. Big studios. I mean, what a thrill, what an honor for especially that cast and crew, what they put together. That's a big deal. It's a big deal. And 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 honestly, you deserve every honor that you got because the movie was incredible. And personally, the honors that you've gotten, uh, two honorary doctorates, your star on the Vegas Walk of Fame, two stars down from Elvis. What? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are you kidding me? And, and I had met Elvis in uh, my previous years, and I'm very good friends with the stepbrothers. So oh, wow. On that whole thing. Wow, wow. Uh, tons and tons of, of awards. Um, uh, and so you're out there now. You, you spent, like you said, 42 years of your life um, in the Arizona Police Department, um, retired. Uh and you're out there now. You're on the stages. You're doing this movie. Um, just you, you keep spreading. Uh, you keep spreading the goodness that is Frank Shankowitz. Uh, what's what's next? What's on, what's on the horizon now? Well, like you said, the speaking. Uh, just I'm already booked in 2021, uh, and I'm so fortunate, George. I have this new career. When I retire, what am I going to do? I don't want to sit at home. And through Greg Reed and then these other accomplishments that have allowed me to get this platform to be on the speaking stage. But the biggest thing to me is, is this give back thing is I'm now uh, um, on six different nonprofit boards, uh, several startups that we want to do. Do I have time to mention just real quick some of these? You have as much time as you sure. want. Yeah. Uh, one is Level Up Homes. We're out of Seattle. This is, again, as a startup. We just got our 501c3. When a foster child turns 18, they are removed from the system is the polite way to say it. They have nowhere to go. They're kicked out of the system. They're homeless. And we're developing, starting in Seattle, group homes where these foster kids from 18 to 23 can live so they can finish high school, go to college, trades, whatever it is, become that adult. We will mentor them and, and get them so we're not on the streets uh, selling drugs, whatever they might have to do to survive. Broadway Hearts, a very fun one. Uh, I know several of the actors, actresses from Phantom of the Opera on Broadway. And the young lady named Jessica a couple of years ago said, I want to start this nonprofit where we can entertain the kids. So we've got our 501c3 there up on that board. They go to the local hospitals in the New York City area, get cast and crew. They go in there, do the dance, the songs, all the Disney type things the kids love. And they're already asking, how can we get these in other cities, theatrical cities around the, the country? Wow. Project Kind out of New Jersey. What's that one called? Pardon? What is it called? Project Kind. Uh huh. This is out of New Jersey. A young lady just came up a couple of weeks ago to visit me in Arizona and said, I need help on this. And she is getting work for the homeless people where they can get food, they get clothing, trying to find them temporary shelters. Um, and she's just been picked up as a sponsor by the New York Giants, which wow. is just a big plus for her. Wow. These people are just full of energy. Uh, U.S. vets, um, they have chapters all over the United States. And that's not part of the Veterans Administration. We have one here in my town of Prescott. Our mission, to find the homeless veterans, to get them into temporary housing, get them into counseling, job training, job placement, permanent housing. One of the CHOP nonprofits in the U.S., 86 cents of every dollar goes through the mission, which is unheard of in the nonprofit world. Um, the Wounded Blue, this is out of Las Vegas. Uh, people think when a police officer is hurt in the line of duty that the city, county, state, everybody works for takes care of him. That's not true. He uses his own insurance. He uses his own sick time to get paid. When that runs out, he doesn't get paid. But the biggest thing is PTSD. Over 200 officers killed themselves in the line of duty, committed suicide last year. We're getting these guys into counseling. And agencies throughout the United States, my agency was the same. Uh, Sarge, I need to talk to somebody. I need to get the ghost out of my head. If you can't handle it, you're fired. We're getting them private counseling. Departments won't know about it. Let's get these guys head straight, get their ghost out so they can be effective and get back to work. And then finally, uh, women of global change. <laughs> I'm the only male board member <laughs> based out of uh, California and worldwide organization. They go in uh, with refurbishing housing, development housing, all of these third world countries, uh, medical supplies, school supplies, like say water, everything else. Just so happy to be on that board too. So it's all a way of just giving back. And the message of the movie, as you saw, is everyone can be a hero. When somebody needs help, help them out. 
and that's what I'm trying to do for the rest of my life. He said, what's going on with all these nonprofits? Unbelievable. I love this. Uh, we'll chat after we end uh, the podcast because I have a couple of uh, people that I can put you in touch with um, for some of these. Um, but, yeah, th this is just incredible, and it's that life of service that uh, I love seeing this, and I, and I, and I hope that uh, – you and I can can continue to be friends and and work together because uh, this is what I'm about. This is what I'm about. Um, all right, guys, it is time for the big three. The big three from the launch cast. Big three is uh, I'm going to list a few things, Frank. You're going to give me your top three for each item that I list. All right, ready? No. All right. <laughs> Don't worry. I'll be gentle. All right. <laughs> First one, top three failures in your life. Um, marriage. Um, wow. You know what? That's it. That's it. I love it. it. I'll accept one. Yep. <laughs> All right. Um, I want, we touched on, uh, 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 the story of you and your wife a little bit. I would love to hear your top three moments with your wife, Kitty. Well, obviously when she said I do. Yep. Now, I'm going to go back just a little bit on that. When I told our board, when we ran our first wish, we mentioned about Popsy. And uh, I went to our board and someday we're going to be national, international, and granting wishes all over the world. They all laughed at me except this one lady named Kitty. And I got my wish three years later when she said I do. So that was one of those top moments of her. Love it. <clears throat> Another top moment, uh, she had never been up to Montana area. I asked her, we're still dating. Um, how about riding on the back of my Harley? We're going to go up to ride to up through Montana and everything else. We're up in the Wind River Range in um, Idaho. She asked, stop. The sun is just coming up. I said, what's wrong? She said, she's crying. I said, what's wrong? She said, I've never seen anything so beautiful. Purple Mountain Majesty, Lord God has produced. I mean, I knew then I had a special person. <laughs> Love it. And then another top moment, the edge of the Grand Canyon, when I asked her to marry me, and she said yes. Okay, so that's another there one. Go. There you <laughs> go. Uh, Frank, give me your give me your top three spark moments in your life. We talked about these before. Those pivotal moments that really uh, paved the path for you. Well, I think number one would be. Um, meeting Juan, that mentorship, and, and then all my, my and I got to convince all my coaches, teachers, and after school, even in the Air Force years and that. Um, number two, reconnecting with my father. And, and we stayed in touch all the years. When we went back to Barry Bopsy in 1980 was the last time I saw my father. But I had an extra couple of days that we could spend together. Now, we always stayed in touch always stayed in touch and you'll know, see in a movie we talk about chocolate uh maybe another one from my father was even when i was in the air force starting when he found me in high school and through my years in air force until he passed away every easter i got this giant chocolate easter bunny in the mail <laughs> love it and i was looking forward to that love it and i went overseas because it took 30 days to ship back then yeah it was pieces <laughs> and my, my guys couldn't wait. Hey, is your dad sending me some money with you? <laughs> That's great. That's all. I, and, and my wife continues that. Uh, every Easter, I get this little chocolate Easter money. It just oh. always bring back that memory of my dad. Oh, you got a good one there, Frank. You got a good yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't want to use the word top for this one, but I want to I want to hear three of your favorite moments in terms of uh, wishes granted. Oh, wow, that's so hard with a half a million wishes. Yeah. <clears throat> um, well, the first wish, obviously, Bopsy um, was so neat. And a quick, real story on Bopsy. When he went after with Disney and he went into the hospital and we learned he only had a few days left, the Phoenix Fire, we stayed in contact with them. And they got permission at the hospital. Bopsy was up on the third floor in his room that they pulled the ladder truck in right and put a ladder up to his window 
I opened up the window and here comes seven firemen <laughs> going to the Bob Caesar film. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> and he's just laughing and giggling. Unfortunately, he passed away <laughs> shortly after that. But again, what they're doing, a favorite moment. Uh, another wish was a little boy in Colorado. He had never been to a restaurant. And that was his wish, to go to a restaurant with his family. Oh. And the chapter up there, I mean, there's thousands of these, but the chapter up there sent him to a fancy restaurant. But before that, they, and not to embarrass the family, can we get you some new clothes? Can we get you this and that? Can we get you a limo to pick them up? And, and that. And this little boy is so happy. A little girl on the Navajo Indian Reservation at the Phoenix Hospital. Uh, the first time she ever seen TV. She's still living in, in the, the huts and so on. Um, dirt floors, no electricity. And she loved the History Channel and Discovery Channel. And her wish was to have a TV. Now, they thought that was going to be very inexpensive, but on a reservation, they had to bring in generators, satellite dishes, gasoline, yeah. everything else. And this little girl, um, and it's all scattered, but they would get her classmates would get on the horses. They're still riding horses up there and just to go to hang around at the hut there to watch the TV. Unbelievable. But there, there's thousands, you know, of these stories all over. I, I'm sure there are. But I'm ones sure to be are. personally involved with. Yeah. Uh, Last one for the big three, and this is an interesting one. Top three lessons that you have learned thinking back on all these years? Be humble. Give back. Help whenever you can. Uh, th those almost are all the lessons right there. Yeah. Right there. It's a great way to end it. Folks. This is uh, this was truly an honor for me. Um, I want to I want to thank you, Frank, for um, not only for being here today and, and sharing your time and being so generous with it. Uh, geez, we're uh, over an hour and a half here, almost two hours. Um, so I want to thank you for being generous with your time. But I w mostly I want to thank you just for what you've done uh, for this world. You know, you you have made an impact. When we look back, when people look back thousands and thousands of years from now, um, and they look at uh, why we went in a certain direction uh, as a people, um, you will be part of that historical data. Um, and, and you really move the needle on this planet. So I want to thank you for that and for the, for the person that you are. Because for me personally, uh, what you do uh, has meant a lot for me um, just in terms of not only hearing your story now, but you know, over the course of the last 10 years of my life on, on where uh, I've gone. Uh, and so people like you, um, standing up and saying, I will do it. I'll be the person to, to start this movement. Uh, so necessary. So I thank you for that. And I thank you for your time today. Well, I appreciate it. It's it really fun talking to you today, George. And remember, closing line, everyone can be a hero. If somebody needs help, help them. And there you go. There you go. That's episode 210. Uh, man, Frank Shankowitz, what a... What a man, what a difference this dude made in the world. Um, there's nothing else to say besides that interview. We miss you, buddy. Adios, amigo. Uh, I know, I know you're, you're feeling good right now. You're, you're in greener pastures and uh, probably hanging out with some of the people that you have helped in life. I'm sure there were thousands of people waiting up there for you, maybe more than that. Um, so we miss you, buddy. Tune in next week, guys. We'll see you later. Into the black hole. Thanks for listening to the LaunchCast today. Please make sure to subscribe to this feed wherever podcasts are available. Follow me, George Andriopoulos, at Launchpad CEO on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. And make sure to visit our website, guys, thelaunchcast.com. Looking forward to the next episode. See you soon, guys.